Hello, welcome to MarshallsDown.com. I am Pedro Bennett, the founder of MarshallsDown.com, and today's date is February 1st, 2016. And today we have a special guest, and our guest is Professor Sam C. Luke. Welcome, Professor Luke. Aloha. <laughs> I would like to thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. I also would like to thank you for um, keeping the art of jiu-jitsu in our minds and and in our hearts and staying true to the principles in which your founder of your art and organization has established. So thank um, you very much. Glad to be here. Yes, yes. Uh, Marsha Down is content to learn more about jiu-jitsu, in particular, your system of jiu-jitsu. So uh, if you would, please, let's get started. Okay. Uh, Professor, uh, tell us about your tr training. Tell us about your training in martial arts experience. Who are you in the martial arts? I started when I was 10 years old. I began because there was a big need. Uh, I was I was living in an area whose nickname was called Hell's Half Acre. Mm. As the name implies, uh, it was a really rough district in Honolulu proper. And going to the movie about a block away, I was getting hijacked by a much bigger boy. It happened a second time. And my dad says, that's it. You will not get any more money going to the movie because you can give your money away. You're wasting my money. So, hey, the, boy, the guy was going to break my butt, you know. <laughs> well, you're not getting any more money until you learn how to defend yourself. That's how it started. And at the time, the judicial clubs were only accepting teenagers and up, and I was only 10. But my dad was the instructor, so he made an exception and allowed me to go to class. Uh, classes were twice a week, only a few blocks away. And Saturday was an open session for those who wanted extra help. Of course, since my dad was running the class, I had to go to Saturday sessions as well. Originally, I didn't like it at first because even though the park was only a block away, the kids would be playing on the street two against two football. When you come home and say, okay, boy, let's go, you know, that broke up my game with my friends and what are three guys going to do? They couldn't play any kind of sports with only three guys. So for a long while, I resented breaking up my friend's games. But about seven months later, after three times a week of jiu-jitsu class, and of course being very attentive because my dad was the instructor, my dad allowed me to try to go to the movie. So with 10 cents, 9 cents for the movie and 1 cent for bubble gum or something, I went to, on my way to the movie, and this same neighborhood bully stopped me and asked me if I had money. And I said, yes. He said, I want your money. I said, no, because I'm going to break your butt. <laughs> and I went into a little stand, and he was, taken aback, and he said to me, well, you learn Kung Fu or something? I said, in my stance, I said, find out. <laughs> and amazingly, he walked away and never bothered me. I, I, I was so, so happy with that, that I didn't have to fight. All I had to do was show courage that I was smitten. Hmm. But even more, even more so when a little while later, my friends were going to the movie. They used to get hijacked too. And I wasn't intending to go to the movie, but I just accompanied them because it's only a block away. 
And when it's <clears throat> when normally the bully would show up, he did show up. And when he saw me with my friends, he turned around and left. Mm-hmm. My friends were so, so amazed at that. You know, I was a neighborhood hero. And from then on, I kind of dedicated myself to being a good judicial student. That's how it started. Mm. You know, you come from a very strong heritage. Would you share with our audience the name of the system or style in which you trained in? Uh, our system is Danzan Ru. And uh, sometimes it's called Koden Khan. Actually, to be technically correct, it's Koden Khan Jiu Jitsu. Danzan Ru was the name of uh, our founder's school. And, you know, so, but either one would apply. Hmm. Danzan Ru was, Danzan Ru, well, the story goes like this. As a older teenager, Shizuro Okazaki came from Japan, and he had a problem with his health. He had shortness of breath. We think it was, you know, asthma or something like that. And he came here looking for help to get cured. Somehow, the Western medicine didn't help him too much. And uh, somebody recommended he go to the judo class. And he tried it out. And lo and behold, after a while, his health condition improved so much that he was dedicated to the art of jiu-jitsu, judo. Then when he became accomplished, he was really accomplished because he took on supposedly a, a mainland visitor who was a boxer who went, went to a judo class and challenged anybody who wanted to fight with him. And uh, Professor, who oh, at the time, Shizuro Kazaki, was kind of pushed into it. He wasn't really a aggressive fighter, but he was pushed into it by his friends. And so he met he met with this boxer, and he won the fight. And that really uh, implanted a strong desire to do more and to help people who couldn't help themselves. Hmm. So when he became uh, a senior in the judo club, he took leave and went to Asia to study other forms of martial arts, including kung fu, more judo, different varieties. And you learn Okinawan, Taekwondo, uh, even stopped in the Philippines and then Eskima. When he came back to Hawaii, he put the best art of all what, that he was exposed to and formed for the gun system. And Very interesting. Then in 1939, he had a big following, by 1939, a big following, and including Businessmen and executives were part of his class. Must have been a, a hundred or so by that time. Some of them were accomplished by 1939. And they talked him into forming what is called the American Judo and Jiu-Jitsu Guild. So basically it was Judo, but the combination became the quote and con system and they incorporated in 1939, which was the first formal organization outside of Asia. Mm. 
you know, did um, did he drop the name judo because I noticed the term now is American Jiu Jitsu Institute? Uh, yes, was there... eventually, eventually, because even though the basis was judo, that uh, this whole system incorporated so many different styles of martial arts, including Hawaiian, the Hawaiian martial art, which is called lua. So there's a, a you know some parts of our art are based on various other arts. The combination became the mm. Okay. All right. Makes sense. Uh, what is the difference in, in um, training pre and post the Japanese invasion of Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941? Uh, how has the training how has the training changed, or how has the system changed over the years, pre and post uh, uh, Japanese invasion of Pearl Harbor? So, um, you know, okay. it, it, you it, might, you might, yeah, you might not be surprised, but I witnessed part of the invasion of Pearl Harbor. Uh, I was about six years old at the time. It was before my entry into jiu-jitsu, before my dad even entered jiu-jitsu. And uh, uh, we weren't familiar with what the jiu-jitsu system was during that period. My father got involved because we had to move from one part of Oahu to, into Honolulu because where we lived about several hundred yards away was a bay which was the most likely place for a Japanese invasion for, you know, if they landed, if they were to land troops on the island. That never happened, but in a precaution, we, the family was talked into moving back into Honolulu itself uh, to be safer than we were if we were to stay where we were living in an area just outside of what is now Hawaii Kai. Previously, Hawaii is a whole community now. Previously, there was a big fish pond. Uh, right next to the ocean, and that ocean bay area was, was where it would have been significantly the best place for Japanese sending craft to arrive on Oahu. A question. My, you know, my, go ahead. Sure, no, no, you go ahead. Sorry. Well, my dad's entry into jiu-jitsu started in Honolulu where he was an air raid warden, became chief, and he had people working for him. The air raid wardens were people who went uh, walking around the neighborhood to see if there was any light shining through the window, which at that time would have been attractive to enemy bombers should they come. And many times uh, you would encounter light shining. You would go to the place for the home to ask them to turn off their lights or cover their window or something. And people were having parties and they resented being interrupted. And Eric Warrens at that time had no baton, no firearm, nothing to protect themselves but their voice. Mm -hmm. And after a while, he decided that, you know, it's not right. If one of these days they're going to get into a big fight and they're going to get hurt because usually at these parties there's a whole bunch of people and here this single air raid warden or maybe an assistant alone will get overwhelmed. So he decided that he should take up martial arts of some kind. Then he didn't have to depend on weapons for protection. So he went to a Kung Fu place and talked to the Kung Fu master, the Kung Fu master, and, and he had along one of his Eric Warren assistants. 
but the assistant was the Japanese guy. When he talked to the Kung Fu master, the Kung Fu master recognized my dad's name, asked him his background, and said, fine, we'll take you, but we don't take him. Why not? He says, this is only for Chinese. With that, my dad said, you can't take him, then I can't come because we're together. And no positive answer from the master. So he left with his friend and sought out jujitsu or a Japanese, any Japanese form. And he was recommended to go to Professor Okazaki's place. <clears throat> However, Okazaki was not a direct teacher. Okazaki's uh, assistant was a guy named Bing Fai Lao, a Chinese guy, uh, prominent in the community. And Bing Fai Lao became my father's first teacher. My father went through the ranks and got his black belt, and uh, that's how it all started for him. And so by the time I was 10 years old, uh, he was a teacher. Yeah, it appears that Law was, what, um, one of seven uh, of the individuals who had trained with the founder? Uh, yeah, there were a good handful of uh, black belts who became very, very successful with Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, most of them moved away. Uh, and like I said, though, my dad was not a direct student of Okazaki. But he spent a lot of time in the gym, uh, yes. in the dojo with Okazaki, but he was taught by others. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, there's mm. other prominent names like Kufarath, Wally J, um, you know, uh, a good handful of students that went on and opened their own clubs, uh, dojos, and subsequently expanded more and more because the whole intent was to <clears throat> spread the knowledge of the Kodeng Plan system. Hmm. Fantastic. Uh, you pretty much answered one of the questions I was going to ask, which I will address in just a second, as it relates to some of the prejudice that um, that you observed during your training, during your study, when you share some things in reference to your father. Um so I would like to uh, explore that just a little bit more. So the question I'd like to ask is, uh, have you noticed any ratio of prejudice, which you just shared one incident related to martial arts uh, throughout your years of studies? Um, um, and you shared the insight. Now, I, I, I have not experienced any prejudice throughout my career. Except, oh, you have? Okay. I, no, I, I said except. Uh, after I became involved with computer science and I represented Hawaii to the mainland organization, uh, I would go up for meetings within the region and we'd have uh, meetings about the computer business, about how our organization could be helpful to members, etc. And quite any number of times after we had our meeting, we went out to, to dinner or went, went after we had to a bar or whatever. And I was the only Asian in the group. Most were white men, and I, maybe a token few women. But on an average of once a year, you know, it's going to making two or three trips a year. But once a year, I would I would find myself in the bar with my friends, and then we would start to mingle with the, you know other guests or have uh, participate in music and dancing, and I would get picked on by some big white bully who 
called me Jap and said, get out of here, you don't belong here. There's still that prejudice in that, in that uh, time frame. This was still like in the late, mid to late 60s. And, uh, but every time I was able to stand, stand up to whoever it was that was trying to push me around, and the fact that I was confident enough to face the aggressor, I always was able to get away from a skirmish or possible skirmish uh, with with just being able to stand up and to say, "Okay, uh, you might give me a few bruises, but." You're gonna to have to call an ambulance for you when, when we're done. <laughs> with, with that, I get away with it, you know. <laughs> I I understand that for sure. I understand it. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. it happened about ten, twelve times in my lifetime. Wow! Wow! So we we're looking at um, uh, about every seven years. I'm, um, <laughs> you know, almost seven to six years for you. Uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, very well, unfortunate. I stayed with that organization, and I had my own my own community of of computer people knew who I was. Nobody ever bothered me from there. But usually, it's the people that lived in that city that we were visiting or whatever. Yeah. And uh, in 2004, I became the national president of that organization. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, speaking of organization, now uh, we often talk about jujitsu. Uh, is there a difference? Um, I understand this is a minor or a trivial question. However, is there a difference in the spelling of jujitsu? And uh, if so, is, is there a reason why? Well, is, people translate the Japanese kanji as as you know they will, and the spelling is. Generally, not that far off where you know what what it meant. However, in in Age American Jesus Institute, we have never changed the spelling. We have seen other people with different spelling, but you know we recognize that. And the and the one biggest the one biggest attribute <laughs> with our current sound system is that. Our system is made up of many different styles that have been incorporated into our jiu-jitsu system. Therefore, AGI opens its arms and welcomes all martial arts. We don't respect, and we do respect some more than others, but we, we you know, we respect all of them. Because every every art has its good better parts and not the good parts. But who we don't criticize if the system works for them fine. So at this time over over my career in AGI as an officer uh yeah I spent something like fourteen years as secretary. Primarily to service to serve my dad. Uh, and when my dad passed away, my dad was passed away a couple of years after he got his 10th rank and, and, uh, had been serving as president for about 12, 14 years when, as far as I know. He was president before I became involved, but, uh, when he passed away, I was going to give up because as secretary, I not only, you know, kept the minutes and I, I was a person who kept the corporation legitimate, reporting to the government, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I was going to rest and retire from AGI, but at the time, uh, the Vice President Francisco Limbago, Professor Limbago, was took over as President. Uh, 
And I told him I needed to take a rest, and he says, uh, "No, uh, I, I want you. I want you to stay on." And I said, "No, I've been secretary for so long. And I'm tired of that particular position." Said, no, you don't have to be that. You can you can move into the position I just left, which is the vice president's position. And I still refuse. And then he said, "What would your father say to you about this?" <laughs> well, he caught me. He caught me. <laughs> Look, I had to stay on because my dad would have wanted me to be um, serving AGI on a continuous basis as long as I could. And uh, Zimbabwe was president for I don't know three, four, or five years, and he became ill and so he resigned recommending me to be president. So I've been president since what, two thousand and one I think. Well martialsnow.com I want to thank you for being president, you know, and you know, and spreading the words of like like say the founder, your father and many, many more individual, individuals who has uh, previous individuals who's been dedicated to the art of jiu-jitsu. And I really, on heart, want to, want to thank you for having such an organization and constantly promoting the organization. And um, hang in there. Um, and, and speaking of hanging in there, over the years, how have you stayed fit and safe in your training? Uh <clears throat> Actually, by the time I became seriously involved in upper management of AGI, I trained very little, by, but what I did was visit different dojos and participated with them. And eventually, I got a little too old to be grappling with the younger guys. <laughs> and... Um, I concentrated on the healing. Now, let me explain. American Jiu-Jitsu Institute is a three-pronged three effort. The arts is a means to the end. And by that I mean the arts is the focus, but behind of it is the intention to keep good character, good citizenship, self-confidence, be a protector of those who need protection, and to be humble. That's the basis of our esoteric principle, which all followers of Okazaki should be following. Yes. Not only, not only to teach it, but to live it and to be good examples of a good citizen, a good neighbor, a good family member, participating to the extent you can to help others. The third element of our program is the healing arts. It's it's a joke, but it kind of applies. And the philosophy is you break them, you fix them. Yes. And part of the program for our advanced students is to learn healing. And we have we have a program for healing. So that's Okazaki himself, our founder, had a had a clinic for healing. In fact, uh, we had we have knowledge, and I know the guy. At the time, this guy named John Burns was a pretty decent civil servant, part of the police force, etc. And as he became popular after the war, or doing part of the war, uh, and his, he was a big politician as well, coming up because he was uh, good friends in the Fofo 2, the least strong sur- surgeons of 
the Democrat Party in Hawaii. He was the leader, one of the leaders for that. Anyway, his wife had polio. And the doctor said she can't carry the baby because the baby will be deformed or your wife will die because she can accommodate the, the fetus. And he was very disturbed by that. What, you know, you kill my baby or you kill my wife or you kill both. And being a good Catholic, he went to the priest. The priest said, you cannot abort. It's just against religion. You know, and he says, well, what, what are those? Well, you can't make a choice of one or the other either. And so what do I do? He says, let's leave it up to God. And he went through several priests. He ended up with the bishop. And the bishop, and he got the same story. You can't do it. You can't do it. He says, you have to leave it up to God. And very distraught, very, very bothered by this whole situation. And he was even advised to go see the leading Catholic doctor, and the doctor, you know, just couldn't give him any better answer. And this went on for weeks, and somebody told him, you know, you've been losing sleep every night, and your wife is... is Devastated because, you know, she might have to give up her life for the baby or the baby got to give up her baby's life for the guy. And he finally was asked to go to see Octobus Okazaki at his clinic. You know, Okazaki had a conference with him and says, well, I can't promise you, but bring your wife to me. Let's see what we can do. And there was the beginning of a relationship. And uh, Professor Okazaki did massage on her. And after a few months, she was getting better. She wasn't, you know, confined to a wheelchair as much as she used to be, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Anyway, bottom line, the baby was born normal. Mm. The baby's name is Jamie, Jimmy Burns. Mm -hmm. Now, I met Jimmy Burns when I was in the sixth grade because we went to the same school. So I knew him, but I didn't know the story then. But eventually the story got to me. And Jimmy Burns became a famous politician. Also, he became a Hawaii judge. And Jimmy Burns, while he was growing up, was the mother called him Shizuo. It wasn't his formal name, but his middle, he was called Shizuo. In fact, it became, I'm sorry, it was a birth certificate. James Shizuo Burns. Shizuo was Okazaki's name. Mm. That's how much they felt close to, to Okazaki. And Jimmy Burns told me that during his, during his early years, the mother never called him by any other name but Shizuro. Hmm. Jimmy Burns is alive, married to a famous local uh, Journalist Annie Toming Bang. In 2001, when we had uh, uh, Ohana, the Ohana is a gathering every other year of all the Kulin Khan clubs and associations. We asked Jimmy Burns to come and tell us his story. So, to a group at dinner of about 500 people. He told the story of the same story I just related to you. Yes. He says, I wasn't there, but I was told the story so many times that I owe my life to Professor Okazaki. Jimmy Burns is alive today. So. And um, he's 
because we went to the same school, we belong to the same alumni association, so I bump into him every now and then. But that's the most famous story about the healing arts that Oka's got to possess and passed on to all of us. I think I think it's a wonderful thing to to be able to to heal, and I I agree. Particularly, if one's going to be an instructor, they must also know how to to heal, just like uh, as well as um, mm-hmm. uh, CPR uh, certification as well. Uh, I I really believe that. So, I mean, good job uh, as far as with your organization. And well, in the in in our curriculum, we have been taught what is called couple. And mm-hmm. couple is a form of resuscitation even before we knew about CPR. Mm. Yes, question. Yeah, yeah. We we were mm. resuscitation before people heard about CPR and the Red Cross development. I think it's imperative if you're doing a style that, um, particularly if uh, one's a style that's choking or strangulations or even thorn in which you could um, take a person out of his breath, et cetera, cause injury or stoppage of a heart or, or the soul. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's good. It's called um, being responsible, you know, and, I, and that's, that's good. Uh, uh, does your faith, I know when we last spoke, you mentioned you know, you're going to be busy on Sunday and, you know, some things about church, et cetera, et cetera. So does your faith contribute to your diligence and study in the uh, in the arts? I'm sorry, what? Does your faith, what you believe in, as relates to your maker, um, does, it, uh, does it contribute to your diligence and your study also in the arts? My religion? Yes, your religion, yes, sir. Yes, actually, because I was going to a Catholic school, Mm -hmm. uh, I was a Buddhist, a Taoist, and my grandma. That's another long story. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I I asked to become a Catholic because in a study hall at school, you know, that all the kids were going to this kind of uh, meeting and that kind of meeting and just a handful of us in study hall and I felt left out. So I asked to become a Catholic. And my dad said, no, I want to know who my mom is. I don't know, but I asked your dad. And, uh, work. I, I asked him, he said, you know, our culture, people embedded in the family, the family, relies on the older male to hold the family together and, and help perpetuate the culture and the, the lifestyle of the family, keep the family together. And he says, I'm the eldest and you're my eldest, so we're depending on you for that. Says, I can do that and become a Catholic. Says, That's not the way it works. He says, one will, one will deter from the other. Oh boy. And I started to cry. I was, you know, but a young teenager. And he said, go see your grandpa and see what he said. So I went to see my grandpa and, and he said, I want to be Catholic. And again, he gives me the same story my dad gave. Hey, you know, you're the oldest of the oldest. No, I'm not the oldest. Well, he's the oldest. oldest. I said, Hank, my cousin Hank, he's two years older than me. He says, what Hank wants me? You know, you see, he's not part of our family. He's our family, but he's not the one that we rely on. He's the one who needs to be more responsible to the wrong side of his you know, background, not, not the loop. Grandma overheard this entire conversation. The first time in, in my life, the first time in my grandpa experience in his married life, grandma ever spoke against what 
his command was mm. his intent in love. Even the my aunties and uncles were surprised that grandma countermanded my grandpa's energy. Let him go. He'll he'll be okay. He won't shirk his duty to the family. And I almost cried mm. on the speaking of them. And Grandpa was also shocked that Grandma stood against him. And Grandma was just a very devout Buddhist. She prayed, she had her own altar in her prayed morning, noon, and night. In fact, when she passed away, I was the first one that her friend told me, you're the guy, you're the one that went for the embarrassment of not becoming a ethic. Yeah, you would be thinking, no, it did be. Number one, she opposed your grandpa. Number two, she's a, she's a saint. Why? The feast of the seven sisters in the Chinese religion. One of the sisters came to visit her on earth. I said, how come she don't tell us? Because we don't talk about these things. I said, how come you know? She said, well, she had to tell somebody. And we were her best friend. So, you know, that last, that last thing impression on me that I have to live up to the commitment of my grandma. Respect that. that. That meant that she believed in you. <laughs> you know, she really believed in you. Yeah, yeah, she had faith that, you know, I will fulfill my duty. Even though I became a Catholic and Catholic religion at the time, I pulled you from mingling with any other religion, you know. But... I had a dual purpose, and it's not so much the religion, but the culture. So even today, as part of my commitment to the Chinese culture, uh, about seven years, my dad was the president of the Chinese, you know, Chinese cemetery, which is a non-profit that belongs to the community. To preserve the culture of many burials, etc., etc., and I became uh, loyal to my father's belief. And eventually, I ended up in prison and I've been president that for about seven years without the company to manage oversee the whole operation. Well, let me ask you a question here. Uh, um, when should we not teach martial arts to a student? Is there a case, a, a scenario in which we should not teach a person martial arts? I would say that we don't make a judgment immediately but when we when we come across a student that has a bad attitude, looking to learn the arts, really to take advantage of others, look for fights to be you know, king of the road or so to speak. Now, we don't immediately dismiss him because we have an obligation to try to change his attitude. Hmm. Understand. We, we, no. we try, we take him in and we try to change him first. If we can't change him, then we dismiss him from class. But I have never seen anybody dismissed from any class that I'm familiar with. Right. We've never been able to change his attitude. Right. You yourself, how do you handle failure? How, how do you handle yeah. failure? You know, with a grain of salt. <laughs> because any road has bumps in it. Yes. You're going to travel the road you must be aware that you will have a bump most or two or three or four. It's not how you fall down, it's how you get up. Yes. Yes. I, I agree. So, so, you know, we have to, this is part of the training to be a strong character. Yes. I, I, I agree. Uh, uh, what is... Uh, What has the martial arts taught you? 
Humility, foremost, humility, and self-confidence. I know what I can do. Yes, yes. And and if you could change anything about yourself, uh, what would it be? Well, I'm 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 hiding, not hiding, but I'm su- I'm suppressing that. I'll catch you. Human, That's good. human nature of being a man. You, you know, even 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 priests get in trouble. Yes, yes. Because, uh, because at some time they 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 lose their ability to suppress their sexual urges. Right. right. So I spend, I spend. I mean, this is very personal, but I, I, I spend a lot of energy suppressing mm-hmm. my my well, manhood. <laughs> well, I, I think most men, men do. You know, I, I, I know when I uh, first, uh, many, many years ago, back in the 80s, um, when I first got married, I, um, you know, I said, I, I love my wife, so I went to um, a minister. And I told the minister, I said, you know, I love my wife, but all I could think about is women, 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 women. <laughs> he laughed at me <laughs> and, he, and he laughed at me and he said, you are a man. <laughs> and he just explained it to me and said, hey, you're a man. And yes, you will have this thought, blah, blah, blah. And he explained it to me that I just need to step away from it, you know, just, you know, and it, it made sense the way that he presented to me the fact that, yes, because prior to that, in uh, my discussion, individuals like, oh, you think of women that's evil, that's bad, etc. I was pretty young at the time, but now I have a better understanding of, yes, we are going to have those urges, and you know, we just have to somehow like redirect, you know, that. But it's, it's a challenge. It's easier said than than done. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, most most definitely, and particularly if, if uh, you know, if one's a, is a Christian, and you go look at the fact that um, we talk about. Um, Going out and multiplying, you know, et cetera. So that, that, that's a challenge, uh, but that's a totally different story. Uh, question: Why why should one study jujitsu? Sorry. Why should one study jujitsu? Well, study jujitsu to learn self confidence. Okay. Okay. And mm-hmm. to learn learn the art so that you can be protected to your family, to yourself, to your neighbors who are not able to fend for themselves in in a kind of skirmish, to your friends. Like, you know, I come to the aid of my friends when I'm on the mainland and my friends get picked on. That's one one instance, Uh, especially with Sacramento after a meeting of the computer society. Right. You know, one thing I, I like, like about the jiu-jitsu is the energy that's that's given when you're teaching the jiu-jitsu. The, you know, just to, to understand how you control someone's body just by off balancing their center, et cetera, is really a rewarding thought, rewarding feeling also, too. It's self-control, so, right? Yes, yes. And, uh... Even you have the urge to, to, to give somebody a, a lesson, you don't do it if you don't have to. You don't have to. You try to talk your way out of it first. Yes. Well, in because because you're you're accomplished the physics, uh, you know that we know what we can do. We have to warn the guy anyway. We yes. owe it to him to warn him to take, you know, like I said, but I didn't want to. You can give me a few bruises, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of you that they don't fall on their um, Most, most definitely. You're supposed to give him a warning because your hands are lethal weapons. Right. I, I, I agree with that, um, unless it will put you on a bad end of the stick <laughs> you know if you know that if you want to share it that's what you know and you know he's going to pull out a weapon that like a 
a projectile, like a, a, a gun. Oh, or something yep. like that. Yeah. I mean, but, it, but you know, it's a manner of speaking. Yes. I, I have never, I have never encountered anybody that would have brought out a weapon or a gun or a knife. But hey, a knife we can handle, a gun we cannot. Yes. Yes. Unless, unless he's within striking distance, you know. Right. But he's not going to be after you want him. Right. But the thing is, if he talk nicely to the guy. Yes, I agree. I, I agree. Uh, obviously, almost all the altercations I've had, I mean, there's tons of altercations in which verbally I've been able to, you know, get out of the situation. And then there's been some situation that I verbally was going to change. Of course, I was a law enforcement, and law enforcement, that's a totally talking about something totally different, whereby I had to use lethal force. You know, even as a teacher, I had to disarm students with weapons. But again, it, I relied pretty much on my Kempo and Jiu Jitsu to, to help me in doing that. But fortunately, I did not really have to seriously injure an individual. Um, as you stated, you know, we want to verbally and if we can get out of a situation without seriously maining or uh, injuring someone, I mean, that's probably going to sometimes going to be the best route. You know, the civil thing is just totally something different. That's a different conversation, you know. So. Yeah, you, you know, you got to come across wanting peace. Yes. Okay. Most, most definitely. If, if you're looking for a fight, you're going to get it. Yeah, you, you got that right. And, and when you find yourself so big and bad, you're going to find someone that's even bigger and badder than you are. And that's for sure. And you never know what that guy knows. He might be a better, better accomplished martial art guy than you. I agree with you on that. Uh, well, what, what is... You know, you, you, you don't flaunt your ability. Yes, I, I, I agree, most definitely. Uh, what is your latest project? What are you working on right now? Uh, this, I'm still involved. You can, I don't have nothing to do with computer anymore except that I use it. Uh, but I'm still involved in trying to help rehabilitate a couple of chapters in my region. Uh, a okay. few months ago, I re- re-elected the region president. Okay. And as a region president, uh, I have responsibility you know, to keep the chapter healthy and performing for the good of the community. So uh, there's a couple of factors that need to be the application. That's one aspect. Uh, I'm involved with uh, the Manoa Cemetery and I'm part of organization that takes about two or three visits a week. Uh, Massing about 10 hours, 10, 12 hours a week that I spend on that. Hmm. Um, American Jiu Jitsu Institute and holding the thing together and trying to, you know, become, have the organization become, uh, even better at what it does. Spread the yes. word, get more followers. And American Jiu Jitsu system, uh, being not because of it, but because we're the founders of the system. I like the first of the movie, uh, try to perpetuate the art as we can. And there's 12 organizations similar to us, half of them bigger, or better of them bigger than us. And they were smaller than us. But they, we have formed an alliance in 2012, Willie Trejo. Do you know the name? No, I, I missed the name. What's the name again? Willie Trejo. What's the last name? And Willie, first name. Trejo. Willie is his first name. Trejo. C A. Oh, yes. Yes. He, he, he is, he is the coach yes. of the judo team for yes. Olympics. Yes, Jiu-Jitsu America, yes. Yeah, Jiu-Jitsu yes. America, right. Yes. Well, he, he, in 2001, starting in Hawaii, he brought up the idea of forming an alliance so that we can help each other perpetuate the ideals of Ahsoka Zaki. And he was head of it for four or five years. And then he passed the gavel to me, and I've been the head of that alliance ever since. Now, a year ago, 
a bunch of smaller organizations uh, wanted to take control and they conspired to eject me from being the president. And there was a big to do at a, one of the monitors a couple of years ago. But uh, bottom line is I had overwhelming support after big discussion and why and that. So I'm still the president of that. But I'm trying you to be, I'm trying to help, to help the organization become a little more formal. In the, in the informal area, one right. vote, uh, no, one organization has three donors. They can, they have the same vote as organization that has 35 donors. I see. So you know, you know, I like the tail wagging the dog. Mm-hmm. So really, the JA people told me, hey, we better straighten this out. This is not right for the small groups to try, try to dictate to the bigger groups. So that's one of my important issues uh, to help solidify the intent that the bigger groups have more to offer, you know, Three, a three dojo group with ten members each is thirty people. They cannot sponsor a Hana meeting for three hundred or two hundred. Mm. And if, no. if they enter into it, if they take a lot, they'll kill them. Mm. So anyway, that's one of the things. Right. Uh, there's, there's a Hawaiian group that had a three million dollar federal grant over a two year period to help uh, revitalize the Hawaiian culture. The nonprofit accidentally I became president of that. Mm. Well, you, you're the last man standing. <laughs> and you're, I, you're the last I, man standing I, for a reason. <laughs> now, my only, my only support for all these activities is I'm still in the insurance business and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a special agent and I still have clients that, you know, I see. Uh, that I service. That's been my career ever since college. That's, that's yeah. how I earn a living, how I raise my family. Yes. Uh, professor, if someone wanted to get in touch with you, what would be the best method to do so? Would it be an email, phone number, website, or would you want them to contact any, me? or yep. Any of the above. Okay. I'm easy. Well, uh, would you... Would you like to share uh, maybe an email, phone number in which they could call or write you? Okay, they can contact me through our AGI website. Okay, and there's, uh, info, there's, there's information there. Otherwise, yeah. my email address is one word, one word smaller. Word link is that Let's have that one more time. The email address. More letters, same mm -hmm. one word. Right. Um, at earthlink.net. Right. Or you can contact at American Jiu Jitsu Institute.org. That's right. Yes, that's the other. Okay. You know, sir, we come to the end of the uh, podcast. Uh, are there any last words you'd like to share? Uh, no, keep plugging, guys. You too. I think, <laughs> yeah. I think what, you're doing, what you're doing is helpful to the martial arts community, and uh, I commend you for doing what you're doing. You know, sir, I really want to. I really want to thank you. If there's anything that martialartsnow.com will find our means to to help you out, and or something you want to get out to the audience, we'd be more than glad to try to assist you in that way. And I really want to thank you. MarshallSnow.com. Want to thank you for um, you know sh sharing your experience and your knowledge because um, you provide a lot of good information. It's um, it's good to hear real tangible information versus just hearsay information. So uh, really, we really um, appreciate what you've shared. Okay, so yeah, I might I might give you one more bit 
bit of information. Sure, please. Since since uh, our seventieth anniversary, we had a kind of, oh, by the way, in my administration of AGI, in the last four or five years, I've had exec I've had an executive retreat where we spend a day, a full day, and overnight, and you know, until the next day, to discuss ways and means to improve what we're doing, and uh, we we committed ourselves way back in 1970 when, well, not 1970, when, uh, but 10 years ago when we had our 70th anniversary, 1939, so what, 79, 80, 99, 99. We, we committed ourselves to promote the esoteric principle. Yes. To everybody that you would espouse that, you know, just to be good people. Yeah, and, and, and that's good. I teach that. I teach that at, at the Ohana, sem at, at one of the seminars. Usually, uh, when they ask me to teach, and I say, what, what I, I would like to teach. I, I usually teach healing or, or esoteric principles. More recently, it's just been the esoteric principles because people have lost that aspect of it. I, I, I agree with you. I was sharing with one of the um, other grandmasters just the other day. A lot of times when people are teaching martial arts, they, it's, it's like an oxymoron in which um, they, people are training to learn how to defend themselves, but they're not teaching certain principles that need to be taught. Basically what they're doing, equipping, um, causing people to become bullies. People who are not bullies, down, they become bullies. You know, so they're defeating the purpose of what, you know, the, the, the intent should be, reason why the person came to them. You know, and so it's good. The principles that you are sharing is, is really, is really important. This is how we keep yeah. um, some sense of balance in the world. You know, we need we we need more humility among all of us. Yes. And you know, it, the reason for martial arts is not to look for trouble. It's not yes. to show that you're better than the other person. In in in, in our judicial system, we say we respect all the arts because yes. of all the arts, ours is one that incorporates most of the other arts anyway. Understood. So Understood. we respect, respect everybody. Every everyone, there's no one better than the other because there's good points and bad points, or good points, not bad points, but weak points. <clears throat> but you know, all martial artists should be one family. I I, I agree. We we should be one family. And in fact, that's one of the primary. That's pretty much how it was many many years ago. Is that we were one family and. We branched off, and of course, we know that more we branch off, more division you're going to have, and more division you're going to have, more strife you're going to have. So I agree. I echo with you that you know we should work together. Okay. Well, sir, we've come to the okay. end. We come to the All end, right. and, and I'm Pedro Bennett, and I want to thank um, uh, you, Professor Luke, for sharing your knowledge, and I want to thank you, audience, for listening, and you stay tuned. Again, this is Pedro Bennett. I will do that. Aloha, and I'm available if you need me. <laughs>